Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today's video is an opinion piece. And I guess it's a bit of a wish list from a consumer's perspective. Uh, things we would like to see Intel do better with that would benefit all of us. As the current market leader and longtime dominant force in the CPU space, Intel's been able to get away with a lot. And really this is because the competition has allowed them to. Uh, some will rally behind AMD, holding them up and saying how brilliant they are, increasing core counts with Ryzen and finally sending us forward after years and years of nothing but quad cores on the mainstream. Don't get us wrong, what AMD's done with Ryzen really is impressive, and we've said so many times on the channel, but they're also a big part of why the past I don't know, almost decade, has been very slow on the CPU front. But now that things are getting seriously competitive, we feel Intel needs to change some stuff, uh, stuff that we've been asking them to change for years now. Last week, Tim and myself were over in Taiwan attending the Computex trade show, and we found ourselves discussing a few areas where Intel, as well as AMD and Nvidia, need to improve to become more consumer friendly, and at the end of that discussion, we thought it would actually make for a pretty good video, so here we are. For this first video, I'm going to discuss the Intel side of things. I'll talk about each point that was raised, and please note that none of these are in any particular order. They're just things that we thought were worth talking about, and some of them will be more important than others. Again, we're looking at this from your perspective, the perspective of a buyer, so let's get into it. First order of business is the TIM. No, not that one. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but Intel no longer solders their desktop CPUs. And this, in my opinion, has been a big issue for years now. I've heard all the arguments for why Intel no longer solders their chips, and honestly, I just don't buy them. The best case put forth is that solder can form micro cracks after a certain amount of thermal cycles over an undetermined period of time. A thermal paste, on the other hand, is claimed to last a lot longer, especially for small die CPUs. What we do know for a fact is that Intel's desktop CPUs ran much cooler back when they were soldered in 2011, the Sandy Bridge days for the mainstream desktop CPUs, while the higher end parts they were soldered up to the Broadwell era in 2016. As a quick little example, the Core i7-3770K running at 4.7 GHz using 1.35 volt would peak at just over 90 degrees running an A-64 stress test using a large tower style air cooler. And then under the exact same conditions, but with 1.4 volt, so more voltage, the 2600K ran at least 20 degrees cooler. And we've seen that time and time again, even with the much newer Intel CPUs, that de them drops temperatures by at least 20 degrees. I've also got quite a few Sandy Bridge CPUs that have been overclocked all their life and have been used on a regular basis over the past seven years. And the thermal performance, as far as I can tell, is exactly the same as the day I first tested them back in 2011. If any of you who are still using a Sandy Bridge processor or an older one and have seen an increase in thermals, I would love to hear about it because I haven't actually heard any reports that they have seen thermals go through the roof or even increase a little bit. So yeah, if you've seen that, please do let us know in the comment section below. That would be very interesting to hear. So although I don't have any real concrete evidence other than the CPUs that I've had for many years now, I, I'm going to call BS on the micro cracks being a serious concern, uh, at least for the most part. It, it, I don't doubt that it does happen, I just don't think it's a serious concern. I don't think it's a legitimate reason for not soldering CPUs. Uh, I still believe the real reason Intel doesn't solder their chips is because it's an expensive process. So this is just a cost saving exercise, pretty plain and simple. Intel is a big business and this is just a classic big business decision. All the evidence does suggest that soldering is clearly a better method in terms of performance, and this is why Intel still solder their Xeon server chips. I'd say it's easier to get away with shafting the general consumer, and uh, with no competition, they can probably get away with doing the same to enthusiasts, at least they have been anyway. I get that pro overclockers are happy to de-lid, and they can even profit from the process by providing tools for enthusiasts to do the same. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong there or dodgy, I'm just merely pointing it out. But for most, I think it just results in hotter processes that are more costly and difficult to cool. So I am pro solder. While on the subject of cooling, the box cooler, that thing could do with a serious upgrade. The 73 watt model supplied with the Core i7-8700 is a complete joke and we don't really want to see any more of that. We, 
we definitely don't want to see any more of that. Again, like the thermal paste, this is merely a cost saving exercise. We've already seen how the Intel box cooler provided with the 8700 can't avoid extreme thermal throttling under load, even with a well ventilated case with an ambient air temperature of just 21 degrees. So this is pretty straightforward and I think everyone can agree Intel needs to seriously up their box cooler game. Sadly though for Intel, they have missed a golden opportunity to release their next generation with a box cooler called the Wraith Ripper. They can thank Cooler Master for that one. So in summary, we want bigger coolers that not just eliminate thermal throttling, but reduce thermals to acceptable levels and soldering would play a key role here as well. Oh, and of course we do want coolers that don't sound like a jet about to take off. That would be very welcomed. Right, so this one is pretty straightforward. And as I said earlier, these requests aren't in any kind of order or aren't listed by any kind of importance. But what I want here is for Intel to start sending reviewers retail products in retail packages. AMD sends retail versions of their CPUs to reviewers and sure, they do test them before shipping, but I don't have too much of an issue with that one. Uh, step one would be at least sending retail products uh, to those that are reviewing them and testing them for potential buyers. Intel sends reviewers QS or qualification sample chips, and although these are technically identical to the OEM or retail CPUs, I'd still much rather show the full-blown retail chip on launch day with all the details on packaging, and possibly even more importantly, the retail cooler, should the CPU actually come with one. For those of you wondering, the QS chips come from uh, an, just an early production run, and they're generally sent out to OEMs and board partners to validate their hardware. So anyone that got their hands on the Core i7-8700 or the Core i5-8400 ahead of release from someone like a board partner, for example, that's how we got our 8400, uh, they would have needed to source a standard Intel box cooler if they wanted to test out of the box performance. Getting Intel box cooler isn't that difficult because they've been shipping the same cooler now with their retail CPUs for a long time. Uh, but you would have to assume that Intel was sticking with the 7th gen box cooler for the new 8th gen parts uh, because that information wasn't really given out. We didn't know what the box cooler would be because we weren't told and we didn't have any retail chips. Okay, so again, remember I'm complaining on behalf of the consumer, not someone who gets products sent to them for review. So someone that actually goes and buys them. That being the case, we obviously wanna pay as little as possible while still getting what we want. And Intel wants to charge us as much as possible uh, while giving us, I suppose, as little as possible. And with limited competition prior to last year, it really has been advantage Intel. Recently though, things have changed and in a big way. But while the competition continues to step up, Intel really hasn't stepped down on pricing. We're getting a little bit more than what we were a few years ago, but really that should be the natural progression of things anyway. Admittedly, pricing for the mainstream coffee light desktop parts isn't too bad. Uh, Intel is still robbing us in a few areas like the box cooler and other things that I've talked about, but it's really their high-end desktop parts that are grossly overpriced, uh, at least in my opinion. And this is largely because Intel wants to avoid cannibalizing their server parts where they do make the big bucks. For example, even though Skylake X doesn't offer ECC memory support, Intel still doesn't want to risk uh, hurting sales of their Xeon series. Uh, the workstation equivalent of the Core i9-7980XE, uh, that costs a further $550 US, for example. But with AMD's recent Threadripper announcement, Intel will surely be finally forced to become more competitive on pricing, and Intel users won't be forced to pay a hideous premium for the same kind of performance that AMD typically offers for much less. Of course, you will also have to stop overpaying for your CPUs if you want Intel to stop overcharging. Something we are starting to see more and more of is Intel abusing the TDP. It, it got particularly bad with the Coffee Lake series and I do have to give credit to Jim at Adored TV for first picking up on this. It wasn't the case with the 8400, but it was indeed the case for the 8700, so we are going to give credit there. And Intel has been able to get away with abusing the TDP because of what it means. Uh, it seems based on the comments that we often read that most people don't realize that the TDP actually refers to the power dissipation when the processor is running at the base clocks. 
The TDP tells us nothing about how the CPU runs at its boost clocks and what sort of cooling is required to run at higher than base frequencies. In recent years, Intel has been pushing the boundaries of the TDP by continuing to shuffle the base clocks lower and lower while keeping the boost clocks as high as possible. This allows them to release a CPU that falls under a certain TDP while still bragging about high clock speeds. Take the Core i7-8700 as an example. This CPU comes with a 65 watt TDP, which correlates to its 3.2 gigahertz base clock. However, the chip has a 4.6 gigahertz single core boost frequency. It can boost a whole 1.4 gigahertz higher than its base, and in the process blows the power consumption well above 65 watts. In fact, we monitored it hitting 128 watts in a short stress test. In typical workloads where you want to and are running well above the base clocks, the TDP rating of the chip is completely meaningless. The problem with this is that some OEMs and even Intel themselves package CPUs like the Core i7-8700 with coolers that are barely capable of dissipating the power specified by the TDP. Some pre-builts even lock the CPU's power draw to the TDP to prevent their terrible cooler from being overwhelmed. Then when a user wants to hit the boost clocks that they've seen on Intel's website, they're unable to do so because the system and the cooler have been designed around the TDP. In the modern landscape where CPUs boost more than a gigahertz higher than their base clock and are capable of sustaining that frequency for long periods, Intel should be using a TDP or similar metric that is an actual reflection of the typical power consumed during those high performance workloads. Buyers would then have a much better idea of the cooler they need and Intel would be forced to upgrade their crappy box cooler to something more capable of running the CPU at its full boost clocks. We'd end up with better OEM systems, everyone would be better informed about power consumption, and we'd all live happily ever after. Okay, I got a bit carried away with how great an accurate TDP rating would make everything, but still, it would be nice. Okay, so the Core i3-8350K is a great idea and all, but at $180 US, there is more wrong here than just the CPU price. I talked about box coolers earlier and how crap they are. Well, in this case with the 8350K and other unlocked K-SKU models, there's no cooler at all. Then making matters even worse is the fact that you require a Z series chipset to enable overclocking, in this case, a Z370 motherboard. Granted, Z370 boards aren't too crazy in terms of pricing, and it is possible to snag one for a little over $100 US, though for that price you are getting an extremely basic motherboard. What would make far more sense is a $65 US B360 board that can support CPU overclocking, and hey, why not throw in some memory overclocking support while you're at it? Personally, I am well and truly over this locked chipset nonsense. Uh, give enthusiasts on a budget the chance to get the most out of their CPU. Uh, Intel's really no longer in a position to get away with this, so you guys need to let them know about it. Again, we realize that AMD is the underdog here and they need to be as competitive as they possibly can be in all these areas, so I'm not saying they're saints, but the fact that you can overclock any Ryzen CPU on a B350 motherboard, an affordable B350 motherboard at that, is really awesome. And if Intel want to limit their losses, they'll do the same. Also, while on the topic of overclocking, we don't just want to see overclocking support extended to more affordable chipsets, but also more affordable CPUs, you know, like the good old days. Apart from being unlocked and more expensive, there really isn't anything, or there really isn't a single thing special about the K-series models. They're just more expensive and unlocked. Uh, they still feature the same crappy thermal uh, interface material that we discussed earlier. I think it was the first point we touched on. And unlike the, uh, unlike the locked models, they don't come with a cooler at all, even a crappy cooler. So as a customer, I wanna see Intel drop the K models uh, and just the unlocked parts altogether. Just get rid of them and make every CPU unlocked. Uh, that would just, that for me, that would make Intel CPUs truly exciting again. It would make overclocking exciting again. And I really feel like this is a win-win situation for Intel. Perhaps I'm looking at this wrong, perhaps I'm naive, but I honestly think this would make Intel CPUs just so much more exciting. I also really can't see this cannibalizing the other CPU lines that much. Well, maybe a little bit, but not, uh, not significantly. And I think the gains would outweigh any disadvantages there. Uh, based on some recent polls that we've done on the channel, it seems like your average gamer doesn't really like to overclock anyway. 
So it's, yeah, it's our opinion that this approach would certainly uh, get more budget conscious enthusiasts talking about Intel CPUs. And that's something that I think we'll start to see less and less of over the next few years if things continue the way they are. Okay, so this is a big one, compatibility. Intel really need to stop shafting us when it comes to compatibility and really only limit support when absolutely necessary. The current and previous few generations all use the same physically identical LJ1151 socket. So why can't you use an eighth gen core processor on a 100 or 200 series motherboard? And why can't you use a sixth or seventh gen processor on a 300 series motherboard? There's no reason, no reason at all apparently. Last year, Intel lied about the reason why compatibility was dumped, claiming that the two additional cores of the new Core i5 and i7 models require more power. And while that is technically true, uh, these new processors don't use that much more power, and at least to my knowledge, there isn't a single Z170 or Z270 board that they wouldn't work on. Intel also noted that the Z370 motherboards have improved memory routing to support DDR4-2666, uh, a slight increase over Kaby Lake's DDR4-2400. Uh, because Z170 and Z270 boards haven't been proven to handle DDR4-4000 without any issues, 2666 is really going to trip them up. You might think I'm being a bit harsh here, and well, I have called Intel liars without providing any evidence, so let's just get to that quickly. Uh, back in October of 2017, Andrew Wu, the ASUS ROG product manager, went on the record in a BitTech interview and clearly said there is no reason why Coffee Lake CPUs can't work on 100 and 200 series motherboards. He said that it was an Intel decision to remove compatibility, uh, the power consumption increase was small, and he also said, but it makes no real difference. So the main takeaway here being that backwards compatibility isn't a problem, but Intel would need to allow it. It's certainly plausible that overclocking headroom is greater on the more optimized Z370 boards, but there's just no reason why the 8th gen CPUs can't work on older motherboards and why those older CPUs certainly can't work on the newer motherboards. And more recently, modders did indeed manage to get Coffee Lake CPUs working on 100 and 200 series boards without any problems. I also haven't heard a single reason why the 6th and 7th gen CPUs couldn't work on a 300 series board. Uh, that is assuming that Intel opened up support. As an example, if your 100 or 200 series motherboard died in a year from now, uh, chances are you would be able to get a new 300 series board cheaper than that of a second hand board using an older chipset. So there's more than half a dozen things we as consumers feel Intel needs to address. Of course, this is merely a wish list, if you will. Uh, we don't expect that Intel will address any of these concerns, but if they did, that would be pretty amazing. And yeah, it'd be great to see them tackle a few of these over the next year. With continuing pressure from AMD, we'd be surprised if Intel doesn't get serious about a few of these points. But so far, they've been fairly stubborn on the idea of change. That said, we are starting to see some serious kinks in Intel's armor as they rush products out, uh, run into security problems, and fake press demos. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hang tight, because next week we'll tackle what AMD needs to fix, followed by what Nvidia needs to fix. So let us know in the comment section below if there's anything you think we missed in this video, and if you have any suggestions for the upcoming AMD and Nvidia versions. As always, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.